One of the things that surprises people when they start to learn about Leo McCary and his career is what a giant he was in his day. His films were both popular and critical successes. His films were nominated for a total of 36 Oscars, and McCary himself won three Oscars. Leo McCary's life is probably as interesting or more interesting than his movies. Leo McCary was born in 1898 in Los Angeles. He was from a prominent family. His father was a, actually a famous boxing promoter in the L.A. area and uh, was a real raconteur and loved to hang out with colorful characters. And I think that's why McCary has always said, you know, there are only so many stories in the world, but there are all these wonderful characters out there. And most McCary films are character driven. Well, I'm we sorry, did. Mr. Hathaway, but I cheat. It's an addiction. Leo McCary tried and failed at a number of professions before eventually becoming a filmmaker. He tried his hand at being a prize fighter, which his father talked him out of. He went and did some mining as a kid. He was a sports writer for the LA Times. He seemed to be kind of a misfit about finding what he wanted to do. And his father was such a strong force in his life, it sounds like his father basically forced him to get his law degree. He'd seen a billboard across the street from the LA Times advertising USC. So he went there to study law. The key, I think, to McCurry's early life was this accident-prone nature and how he recycles it later in his slapstick comedy. While he was at USC, McCurry had one of the first of many accidents in his life. He fell down an elevator shaft and was, was badly injured. He fell down about five floors, broke both of his legs, and he put a good spin on this. He said that the uh, 2000 or $5,000, depending on which version you hear, that he got as a settlement was the first income that he ever got. He started out, he was going to be a lawyer. He actually liked to write music, but he didn't think he could make money with it, and his father was keen on him being a lawyer. And uh, as he said, the problem was he was too young and, in fact, too good-looking. He didn't say that, but he was. To be a lawyer, he said pe when people are in trouble, they want somebody older. Leo McCary wasn't exactly a legal eagle. He, in fact, never won any case that he ever worked on. One day, he was finally got a, had a client, and he was defending the client. And uh, in court, he, uh, he found that his client was a, was a bastard. It was a spousal abuse matter, and he was representing the defendant. And the wife walks in with two children, and she's late, and she's got a black eye. And she apologizes to the judge if she can't present her case well and that she's late. But, you know, he, he just beat me. This incensed McCary, and he, he told the judge, uh, Your Honor, can we take a brief recess so that I can go out and find other counsel for this louse? And the client chased him out of court, and as he was running down the stairs, somebody said to him, What are you doing, Leo? And he said, Practicing law. And he ran all the way to Hollywood, as he put it, where a friend of his, David Butler, who was an actor then, became a director, got him into pictures, and his first job was as a, what he called a script girl for uh, Todd Browning, famous horror movie director who was working mainly with Lon Chaney. His early entry into movies doesn't shout comedy or anything along those particular lines. And I think McCary was like a lot of um, young people trying to find a career somewhere. I don't know as he knew what he was going to be best at later on. McCary is one of those guys like George Stevens who started out in the business kind of at the bottom level and uh, got going in silent days working with a silent comedy. And I think that was among the best training that anybody could have at that time. He had an amazing quality of uh, understanding people's ridiculous behavior. He, 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 but instead of, instead of uh, condemning it, he sort of celebrated it. McCary, uh, first claim to fame was he took a skinny comedian that worked at Hal Roach and a heavy set extra and put them together. Uh, one was Stan Laurel and the other was Oliver Hardy. And as he said, one was paid $100 a week and the other was getting 60 And so for 160 he had the best comedy team in pictures. He worked with, with some of the greats who weren't greats when he worked with them. I mean, he put Laurel and Hardy together and uh, then later on, of course, uh, he would work with Harold Lloyd and, and with Mae West and with the Marx Brothers and, and so many of the, the famous comedians before he kind of established himself as one of the key directors of screwball comedy. The Marx Brothers did Duck Soup, which is arguably their best picture. And 
then directed Charles Lawton in Lawton's great, greatest comedy performance, a picture called Ruggles of Red Gap, which was a big success. That led to uh, a picture he made at Columbia in 1937 with Cary Grant and Irene Dunn, The Awful Truth, which was a big success and for which he, got, he received the uh, Oscar as Best Director. The story goes that basically the persona we now know, the sophisticated romantic lover uh, that is Cary Grant, comes from Leo McCary, and it comes from this specific film. And this is from a lot of different sources. Garson Kanan, who directed My Favorite Wife, uh, has said in interviews that that definitely was it. The Awful Truth was where Cary Grant borrowed a lot of these gestures, movements, that kind of suave kind of character who's self-deprecating at the same time. You know, he's handsome, he's debonair, but he, he's not so full of himself that he, he almost sees himself as an everyman, even though the rest of us want to be just like this particular individual. What did your nurse read to you at bedtime? Let me see. The memoirs of Casanova? Every night. And then we turn out the light. We? I was only so big. Hmm, you must have had a happy childhood. Ah, mm, oh, yes. Leo McCary was such a, a charismatic, enthusiastic, good-looking, comedic-type character that you can go all the way back to the silent era, and different um, people that worked with him said it was almost you started mimicking Leo McCary, and you can go all the way back to Sam Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Supposedly some of their gestures and their movements were actually drawn from him. And so by the time you flash forward to The Awful Truth, Cary Grant found himself kind of mesmerized by this character, too. And you have to remember, even though Leo McCary was a happily married Catholic man, he had kind of a straying eye. He was a bit of a player, even though he was happily married. So The Awful Truth is not only a classic screwball comedy. McCary wins his first directing Oscar. It wins a lot of nominations. It's a huge, huge hit. But it also is the birth of what we now know of as Cary Grant. They had a strange relationship, he and Cary Grant, because... Grant had tried to get out of the awful truth because McCary had this odd way of working. He would often improvise scenes. He would go into a scene with very little and say, okay, let's talk about it. And he'd work with the actors and sort of improvise. And if he couldn't come up with an idea, he'd go off and sit at the... And he had a piano on the set and he'd play the piano until he came up with an idea. That well, was pretty unorthodox. And it's, it, it, it threw Carrie in 37 to the point where he actually tried to buy his way out of the movie. Well, this irritated the hell out of McCary. And years later, when I interviewed him, just a few months before he died, he still irritated him that Carey had tried to get out of the picture. And they did three of the films subsequent to that. I was bored to death. I hadn't seen one attractive woman on the ship since we left. Now, isn't that terrible? I was alarmed. I said to myself, don't beautiful women travel anymore? And then I saw you. And I was saved, I hope. The sort of combination of things that were funny moving into things that are sad became a McCary trademark. And uh, the first time it really worked for him was in a picture he made two years after The Awful Truth called Love Affair with Charles Boyer and Irene Dunn. He couldn't think of a story. And his wife said that whenever he was trying to think of a story, he was always very difficult to live with. So she said, let's go to Europe. Let's take a trip. Maybe you'll think of an idea. So they went to Europe, and he couldn't think of a damn thing. And they were on their way back, and they were about to enter the port of New York, and they met on the deck, the wife and Leo, and he said sarcastically, well, it sure was a good idea to go to Europe. I, I had a lot of ideas. And just then the Statue of Liberty came into sight and it popped into his head the whole plot of Love Affair and what subsequently became the remake An Affair to Remember. You have a date, my beloved, July the 1st at 5 o'clock. But you don't say where. Will you name the place and I'll obey? I don't know, I can't think. How about the top of the Empire State Building? Oh, yes, that's perfect. The way that the, both pictures have this kind of screwball comedy cute meat thing on the boat. And it plays that way until she has the accident. It plays like, you know, a screwball comedy or a light comedy. And then the accident veers in a direction you didn't expect it to go at all. 
the big moment that changes everything in love affair is the accident when she's looking up instead of looking at the traffic, looking up at what's waiting for her on top of the Empire State Building. Uh, and then the ironic thing is that the year after that was made, and while McCary was preparing My Favorite Wife, he was in a, an automobile accident and almost died. It was a horrific accident, and it took him a while to come back from it. He couldn't direct My Favorite Wife, unfortunately, because the picture suffered. It's, it's a good picture, but it's not a great picture, and it could have been if Leo had directed it himself. It's a Garson Kanin picture, although very much infused with McCary's spirit. McCary makes the best of it. He gets jokes out of his situation. McCary used that self-deprecating for comedy's sake. Evidently, his arm was so badly um, hurt or injured that they reattached part of it incorrectly. They had to go back, and he said they had to have retakes on his arm. You know, I mean, he, he played it comedically. Because of the, um, the awfulness of the accident, it probably contributes to the alcoholism. Along with the great stories about his, his box office appeal, stories of his drunk driving arrest, reckless driving conviction. Uh, he's told by a judge to abstain from alcohol for two years. But during that period, he's arrested outside of a restaurant on Pico Boulevard for getting in a fight. It seems to be alcohol related. So McCary is haunted. He's got his demons. He was probably an early victim of prescription drug abuse and things like that. So. It doesn't initially hurt his creativity because he still makes a number of wonderful films in the next few years, but in the long run, it was, it was probably a, a very big negative in terms of shorting the career and, and, and having him not be as quite as on his game as he was later on. But he, he uses it in a lot of ways to reframe it in a positive way because he was the eternal optimist in a lot of ways, despite negatives in his private life. McCary's automobile accident had a huge effect on him. Certainly there, there are elements of spirituality in his work um, before that, but after that, particularly in Going My Way and, and uh, The Bells of St. Mary's, he chooses to focus on the kind of, of priest that he thinks the Catholic Church should be putting out uh, all over the world. You really see, I think, McCary's um, Catholicism, his, his intense belief in, in God and, and in an afterlife coming out in those films in particular. And boy, did he strike a nerve with those pictures because they were uh, gigantic successes financially and, and critically. And uh, you know, I know because of my RKO research that the Bells of St. Mary's was the most successful film that RKO ever released. Not that every film that he made after that was a serious kind of tract with a re religious overlay to it. That's certainly not the case. But you see it in, in the work uh, after that. Catholicism plays an important role in Leo McCary's films. This is probably most obvious in Going My Way and The Bells of St. Mary's two films that feature Catholic priests and nuns as main characters. Love Affair and the remake, An Affair to Remember, are actually good examples of how religion, and specifically Catholicism, plays a part in McCary's uh, film universe. I just think that the whole film is, is a little allegory about redemption of one's life, and the fact that it has the, the religious overlay uh, to it um, with the chapel scene in, in particular. And, and then uh, once that scene is over and they make the commitment to each other, each of them then begins to find ways to be better human beings. And the chapel seems so charming. Oh, would you like to go in? Oh, may I? Oh, je vous en prie. Oh, thank you. Leo McCary was a very strong Catholic, gave a lot of money to the church and did a lot of positive things for the church, but like, he was kind of a lapsed Catholic too in his romantic inclinations and evidently he had a heavy duty guilt complex, you know. And he would often use that, I think, you, sexual tension might be a, a good word, be, in, in some of his other more directly Catholic films like um, Bells of St. Mary's and Going My Way. Leo McCary, when you look at the length of his career, he didn't make 
a lot of movies compared to some filmmakers. And his movies invariably tend to be very personalized. And so I think that An Affair to Remember is in some ways a kind of a look at his life of sorts. The use of chance, the hopeless romantic that he is, the, the strength of Catholicism, the near fatal accident that maybe jeopardizes this relationship, but then the fact that things do work out okay. He said he got Oscar, Oscar, Oscaritis or something and didn't make another picture for a few years because he didn't think anything was good enough. Then he made Good Sam, which was not a hit. Not a bad picture, but not up to the commerciality of Going My Way and the Bills of St. Mary's. So he went into the 50s under a cloud and made an unfortunate movie called My Son John, which was a sort of an anti-communist movie. It has some great stuff in it. It's a strange movie, very odd movie. Uh, but it had the bad luck of having his star, Robert Walker, get killed before the picture was finished. They had to sort of jerry-rig the picture. In the mid-1950s, with McCary's career sort of stalled, he decided to revisit his past. He would remake Love Affair. The issue was mainly with the title. Love Affair was registered with another studio. But they had to come up with something. They had a lot of horrible horrible possibilities. But finally, An Affair to Remember was hit upon, and it was, of course, perfect. He had some obligations to 20th Century Fox, and he, he needed to do a property, and, and he was reluctant initially to remake one of his films. But, I mean, lots of directors were doing it. I mean, Howard Hawks basically did that for much of his late career, and Capra had, had already done that and would do it again with A Pocket Full of Miracles. And so I think it was being done. And, and then Cary Grant was very much after um, Leo McCary to remake Love Affair as an affair to remember because he had visited the set in 1939 of the original film and bemoaned the fact that he didn't get that part against one of his favorite leading ladies, Irene Dunn. You can imagine if Cary Grant ever took uh, Europe to America cruise that he would be treated exactly the way that the Nicky character is treated uh, on the boat. Are you Senor Ferrante? I have a telephone call for you from Paris. Mr. Ferrante, would you autograph this? Mr. Ferrante, let's wait. I want another telephone. Thank you. A lot of the humor in the film comes from the way that he deals with his celebrity status. I beg your pardon. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. No, no, bad. No, bad. Oh, oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> oh, that's a very interesting camera. May I see that? Oh, yes. It's new, isn't it? Thank you. Oh, please, please, stop. Oh, that's unfortunate, isn't it? That was not very nice. So it's like a perfect merging of an actor's persona and a character. Cary Grant was arguably the greatest leading man in the pictures. You know, Cary could play comedy and drama equally well. According to McCary, Cary Grant was terrific and very easy to work with and excellent in An Affair to Remember. So if maybe they finally worked it out together. <laughs> you know, it was 20 years later. It was 20 years after The Awful Truth they made their last work together. Shall we join the others? Well, all right. Well, why not? What have we got to lose? <laughs> Last night, let's make the most of it. <laughs> An Affair to Remember is this wonderful culmination of a directorial career for Leo McCary, but he still has directing in him, and he still owes pictures to 20th Century Fox. So he does Rally Around the Flag Boys with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, and with Joan Collins, who's especially good. Didn't work. It's one of what the French would call a film maudit. It's a damned film. It didn't quite work. It, it, it's a picture that works in theory better than it works in reality. And um, I like it because it's Leo McCary, so it's, I, I enjoy being in his company, even if it's not his best night out. And that's worse. Well, Harry, what else do you suggest? Oh, Angela, I'll let you take this and go. Okay, fine, I'm going. He has one more picture to do film called The Devil Never Sleeps, originally, which we know today as Satan Never Sleeps. Satan Never Sleeps. Satan Never Sleeps, if you're a fan of McCary, it's kind of painful in a way to watch because it just, it, it doesn't really work. McCary told me he just didn't think it worked at all. He was very unhappy with the way it worked and felt that Bill Holden didn't like him, didn't listen to him, fought to change the plot and... 
So he was not at all happy. I asked him, did you like William Holden? No. Did you like Franz Nguyen? No. Did you like Clifton Webb? No. I said, you really didn't like the picture? No. He said, I just gave up after the last five days. I let my assistant finish it. McCary wanted to revisit that sexual tension to have a priest very enamored of a woman and basically sacrifice himself so he would maintain his vows of celibacy. And William Holden, so the story goes, did not want to did not want the character to die, and when push came to shove, Carrie was shocked to find out that the star was more important than the director. And now, the moment I've been waiting for. Father O'Banion, goodbye. Till we meet again, Father. Please let me leave on a happy note. Satan Never Sleeps was ultimately a disastrous experience for Leo McCary. Um, it was his last film. He, he walked away from the industry. He'd done a lot of writing about how films had become sadistic, how people left nothing to the imagination in, in terms of sensuality. And he felt that there needed to be some classification of movies, something, something that would say certain films are for kids and certain films are for adults. And he, and he was active in, in voicing those opinions. But he never in the 60s directed again. Ultimately, he, he contracted emphysema. His life ended in 1969 due to that illness. I, I think Leo McCary made some remarkable films that, again, are the kind of films that nobody makes today, movies about people. And then there's An Affair to Remember, uh, which survives as maybe McCary's most famous film. It certainly is a testament to what McCary was famous for, which is the ability to do comedy and drama in the same movie and make them both equally potent. McCary, the greatest comedy auteur in the history of American cinema, and also um, one of the most interesting lives and characters in American film history. So I think either way you look at it, what a fascinating character. Leo McCary is one of those filmmakers that will continue to be rediscovered by uh, people in the future. They'll keep going back to his films. Certain of his movies, Duck Soup and Love Affair and Going My Way and Bells of St. Mary's and Fair to Remember, they hold up. They really do. When I think back on McCary, I remember he had the greatest smile and the greatest laugh. And um, there he was, you know, dying of emphysema and smoking cigarillos, and inhaling them. That was, you know, okay, that's Leo. <laughs>